This talk concerns uh, carousels or roundabouts or merry-go-rounds as they're known in this country. The first part deals with the history of the roundabouts, how they came to be as they are now. Uh, secondly, the mechanics to a slight degree. And thirdly, the art. And finally, the music of the roundabout. This uh, first slide shows a uh, roundabout as you know them today, 1978, taken in Yorkshire at a fair, and the talk will show how we arrived at this finished product from the very early beginnings. The credits for the talk are now given here, in that it's myself giving the talk, and what we proudly present are merry-go-rounds and roundabouts. The history of the roundabouts is the first section, takes about maybe 10 minutes, and this is the earliest carving I can find of anything resembling a roundabout. It's 500 AD, a wooden carving, and it shows a circus scene in which here is a circus ring, the audience, and in the middle is a pole supporting two men in baskets who are being spun around purely for entertainment. You know it's a circus because of the other performers being acrobats, escapologists, animal trainers, etc. We'll discuss now how we arrive at the name carousel for what is normally known as a, a roundabout or merry-go-round. Uh, it goes back really to the days of the Crusades when our uh, soldiers went to the Middle East uh, to convert all the infidels over there. And this is the 11th, 12th and 13th century. And when they got there they discovered that the Arabs had a, a, a sort of game in which they trained their soldiers by charging at each other on their horses. Uh, but not with swords or lances, they carried little clay, clay balls in their hands, full, filled with a scent. And the idea was that they threw these clay balls at the oncoming enemy, in inverted commas, who had to catch this without breakage. Because obviously if he broke this, he got showered with a scent that was contained within, and uh, would have funny words said about him when he got back to his barracks. But nevertheless, uh, that was the scheme. And this game which was mainly for military training, coordination of hand and eye of the Arab soldiers, was known as a carousellus, the Arabic word a carousellus. So the knights of Britain, when they got back, took this game and they decided a good idea to train uh, soldiers. However, on the way, it came back via North Africa, Spain and France, and in France they held these competitions in a large field near the Louvre in Paris, and this is known as the field of the carousel, that is to say, the field of the battle training. And the men would charge at each other in this case, and near this site today there is erected an arch with horses on top, built by Napoleon, and it's called the arch of the carousel. This has nothing to do with carousels as we know them on, on fairgrounds. It's still connected with military training of soldiers. To somebody that the idea of charging up and down great big fields with armies of men uh, on horseback could be simplified if instead of going in straight lines, they were made to go round in circles. And so the men were then mounted on some sort of support and rotated, and in the process, uh, could adopt some sort of aiming with their hands and eyes to improve their targets on the field. Um, the direction of rotation of these is interesting because um, in France they tend to rotate from left to right as you view them. Uh, this is because uh, in those days the men had lances, not swords, and were carried normally in the right hand. It was assumed the soldiers were right-handed. So to mount the horse, they would go up to this roundabout device and throw the left leg over the horse, holding the lance on the outside of the rotation, and aim at a target which is supported on some sort of stand. That was fine, and therefore to do this, they had to go from left to right, since the lance was on the outside of the rotation, if you think about that. However, when we came to swords in this country, the swords were normally carried in a, a holder or scabbard on the left-hand side, and this made it impossible, if not downright dangerous, to throw your left leg over with the scabbard at the left side and getting trapped between the horse and you. So to, do, to cure that, they decided that they would mount the horse by throwing the right leg over. Now if you imagine this uh, left-to-right rot rotation, if they throw the right leg over, they're going to be facing the wrong way, the rear end of the horse, and they'll be moving backwards. Think about that for a moment. So what you do is you turn the horse round so they are facing the head, 
But now, of course, the, the horse is now going backwards with the rider, and to correct that, you reverse the rotation and the roundabout moves from right to left. And that describes the, the direction of rotation in this country as opposed to France. On the continent generally, they still go from left to right by convention. What do we attribute the popularity of these roundabouts to these days? Well, the parents can see the children on the horses as they go past, and they see them regularly, every, every revolution, and they can see what they're up to. The children, for their part, don't go riding off into the, the, the Wild West, and never to be seen again. They appear every rotation and see their parents, so they are reassured. So the whole thing is a good family connection thing, psychologically, they are connected and happy doing this. This slide shows some example uh, of the early efforts to train soldiers. These are Persian soldiers mounted in rope slings and they've been rotated by one man here, a sort of one horsepower, one man power roundabout. And as they go around, they use their, they use their feet to attack this man who is the target. They're trying to knock his hat off. But of course he's not undefended, he has this baton in his hands and he knocks seven bells out the soles of their feet when they try to knock his hat off. That is the competitive part of it. So they must be very skillful in being in the right position at the right time to knock his hat off if they can. This slide is an improvement on the other one in that they're no longer sitting in rope slings which are downright uncomfortable but they are sitting on simulated horses and uh, actually chariots as they were in those days and carrying lances as, uh, as I've already mentioned. So because of that you can see here the reason why the roundabout is moving from left to right because the target is this ring and their lance is used to pierce the ring to get their coordination improved. This is a, a picture later on uh, of a small boy in the 19th century in America and funny enough, although it's many hundreds of years later, they're still doing the same thing. And the small boy has got the equivalent of a lance in his hand, and he's trying to pierce a ring. And if he does this successfully, as this horse is galloping, by the way, he's going up and down like a real horse would, uh, he gets a reward by going to the owner of the roundabout and claiming a free ride, which he gets. The girl behind is anxiously waiting to do the same thing. This is a picture taken much later, about 1989-ish or maybe later, and it shows a small boy here in a rocket ship. We're up to date now, and this ship can be controlled by the boy using his left hand to raise or lower it accordingly as he comes round. With his other hand, he has to catch little Mickey here. Now Mickey Mouse has got a tail, and it's a detachable tail, and the skill is that as he comes, his left hand has to catch the tail and pull it off. Not so easy because the owner of the roundabout himself is not allowing this to dangle in a stationary manner, but is swinging about as well. So it's quite skillful if he can catch the tail. And in doing so, he gets a free ride taken to the owner. We're now going to have a very short uh, interval talking about the mechanics of the roundabout. Nothing very uh, complicated here, as you will see. This slide shows the naming of parts, as we used to say in the services, and shows the names of various important parts of the roundabout. Obviously, there's a platform here, which uh, all the rides can stand on. Uh, there's a chariot in this case. The rounding board is used both to carry artistic designs and decoration, but also uses publicity phrases for the owner of the roundabout, saying it's the best roundabout in Britain or whatever it is. The horses, uh, various types of horses, this one is an outside stander. It's a stander because it stands on all four feet, as it were, and does not gallop in any manner. The other one is called a jumper, or in this country a galloper, and it does perform the action of a horse uh, jumping over a, an obstacle or whatever. Uh, in the centre there are always mirrored panels. Now the mirrored panels are to reflect the light and give a sparkle to the roundabout. And there's also a scenery panel in general here. So having a grasp of the various bits and pieces, we'll go on to some of the mechanics now. This one shows the way that the roundabouts were driven in the early 18th, 19th century. There's an outside steam engine here, blowing off excess steam, and there are ropes going into the centre to drive it. And of course uh, the men are here maintaining it because the ropes have probably got jammed or whatever. 
on the horse itself, however, on the zebra, there's this lady sitting, side saddle, as was the case in those days, with a, a fancy hat, and the little boy here is dressed for the period with his long trousers and a cap, and he's hoping to get a free ride, no doubt. Uh, an American round about this, and going from left to right, you'll notice. Because in America, they haven't quite made up their mind whether they're continental or British, and therefore they can roundabouts go both ways, either way, I should say, in America. This is what's called the centre truck, an essential part of the mechanics of a roundabout. It carries the whole works of the roundabout on this device here. This is a steam one, which you won't see nowadays, but there's a boiler here, you push the coal in there, it heats the water in here, which boils, and the steam drives the steam engine, which turns the mechanism here and rotates that drum via this gearing. So as the drum goes round and round and round, it carries with it the rides uh, mounted, as you'll see in the next slide. That's the centre truck. There is the, the mirrored panels I've spoken about. It's usually on wheels to manoeuvre it into position. It's not used to carry it from place to place in the country, obviously. Um, this is an interesting part called the chimney, because in the early days of the steam one you've just seen, it actually carried all the smoke and the steam and the soot up into the fresh air above the roundabout canopy. It doesn't do that now because this is an electric one, but it's still called a chimney because of its function. And that's how it's positioned when travelling from A to B in the country to get under low bridges and not be too top-heavy. However, when you arrive on site, the chimney is erected, as you see here, and the, the centre truck is now on the bolsters to stop it sinking into the soft ground. The next thing that happens is that the arms are put out like this from the centre, and they are the arms which are going to carry the various rides round the roundabout and are supported from the top of the chimney, as you see here. Once the arms are in place, the roundings can be put in place and these rods go down to support the platform on which the rides are going to be mounted. And there's the mirrored panel in the centre again. The galloping action is engendered by a crank action, which is not very clear in this, but there are three cranks there, which go round and round and round and round and round. And on these are mounted the horses by curly poles, brass poles with a twist. And that causes the horses, three abreast in this case, one, two, three, to gallop, as you'll see later on. This is a, a typical uh, roundabout horse. Uh, it doesn't look like a real horse because the coat is not brown or white or whatever. It's very highly decorated but conventional. Carried again on a twisted pole like so and a step to enable you to mount. The back end is either mounted uh, with a, a hair tail or a plastic uh, tail, a wooden tail as part of the horse carving. Now, let's consider the art of the roundabouts, which is uh, very conventional, as you'll see. This is a roundabout uh, taken at the Mound in Edinburgh, as you can see by the Scott Monument here, uh, run by John Graham of Saltcoats, and it shows the roundings which I've described here, describing his own roundabout and how good it is. The horses below are seen galloping, and the platform is here. Now, we'll look at this little item here, which is of interest on the roundabout. And here are the horses, and typical of a horse is that the mouth is wide open, usually fierce looking, the ears are very pricked up and forward, the nostrils flaring, and the eyes very wild looking. They're meant to be aggressive horses. This, of course, puts some children off, and to counter that, every uh, roundabout of a classical design has 30 horses and 6 cockerels. The cockerels can be used by children who are too timid, to ride these horses. The horses themselves are gaily painted as you can see and on the cheaper roundabouts are only painted on the outside where the people see and the insides are not painted. But this is a first class high quality roundabout. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, the horses themselves are, are, have been neutered as it were because at one time in the Victorian days the horses, the mares and the stallions had real genitalia and this was objected to by the Victorians so they had to be removed. So all the horses have had the operation. And here they are, racing around. Now the other thing that's important is that they are facing outwards. Whichever direction they're going, they always arrange to face outwards, facing the people. Two reasons for this. 
One is that it was thought improper by the Victorians to have a horse behind staring at the behind of the horse in front. You see what I mean? And especially if it's galloping up and down and with a fierce look in its eyes. So they discreetly turn the head away from the, house in fr from the horse in front, as you see here. The second effect of turning the head outwards is that every revolution the horse will look at the parents of the child sitting on it. And this is a reassuring psychological effect in that the parents know this horse is friendly looking at them uh, carrying their little boy or girl. Uh, the step is shown here to enable you to ride on it, to mount the thing, and uh, the, at the bottom is a, a guide rod in the floor of the, the uh, platform to stop the thing flying out too far, just controlled as it goes round. This is a, a, a roundabout in Paris, and the reason it's shown, you'll notice the left to right ro rotation of this now, that horse there is known as a king horse or lead horse, in that it's more highly decorated, it is bigger, and is obviously the leader of the ring of horses, which is, has now got a, a beginning and an end. He is the leader, and the end is in front of him. We have some pictures here of king horses, uh, showing the, the rich decoration, and how they stand out from their colleagues alongside. Here's a king horse. Now, again, very fierce, the head's tied in, as they do in, in circuses, and the fierceness of it, however, is relieved by a collar around the chest here of flowers or roses or coloured and jewels in some cases to take away some of the fierceness. This is a classical horse, you can tell it's very old by the cracking of the paint, but is typical of its age. And the next one is solid carving out of wood. Here you can see through to the fresh air of the, behind it for the main. And here you have the jewel effect to relieve the severity of the whole operation. And the next one shows a horse with a gold mask and again some relief here. Note behind though his neighbour with a very ordinary horse. Ears, eyes, mouth. Ears, eyes and mouth. Very different. This is a workshop in America where they make these horses in the old days. Nowadays, of course, they're made out of fiberglass on moulds. But in those days, they were carved out of solid wood. And here you see the, the, the joiners and car carpenters carving a body here. The legs are made separately and stuck in place. The head and neck are separate and stuck in place. And the whole floor is covered with chippings and obviously a very severe fire risk, but that's how it was. And they're not always horses. On the walls here there are models of lions and tigers as alternative animals that can be put on the roundabout. This is about uh, the early 19th century in America. Here is a roundabout in, uh, in France and notice that the organ is outside but the roundabout is here. The special feature of this is it's a double decker. There are ladders going up there which enable people to climb up and down to reach the upper story, as it were. Here are horses which are known as prancers because they're hinged at the back end and only the front legs leave the ground. They're known as prancers. These weren't very popular, especially in America, because uh, while people are trying to get off the top flight here, down the stairs, people were trying to mount and they got in each other's way and the Americans felt that the turnover of people was not high enough to get to make the money. So they never caught on in America, but they're quite uh, frequently seen in France in various towns. This one was in Perigord. Uh, the organ is outside, and we'll come to the organs later on, because there's no room for it inside, as is normally the case today. That same roundabout has beautiful Italian uh, decoration. The roundings you can see here carry canals and uh, various gondolas and so on. Uh, on the roof, however, are the Venetian ladies painted, the canals, the houses, and beautifully gold embossed and so on, and velvet curtaining, a beautiful uh, roundabout restored by the Italians. Not twisted rods to support the platform, however you'll notice. The main manufacturer of uh, organs for the music in uh, roundabouts and carousels in this country eventually, was a man called Gavioli. Gavioli himself, however, was born in Italy, in Modena. And he travelled to Paris, where he set up a factory to manufacture these organs. And he decided in 1870 he would move from Paris to Alsace, uh, in, the west, in, the, in, the, in the east of uh, France, 
where he ran straight into the Franco-Prussian War. The result of this was that his factory was completely destroyed. Uh, that was 1870. Now, in 1892, uh, his son Anselm took over some of the work and the development of these organs. And his great contribution to the uh, organ music was to produce what they call the book organ. Now, a book organ is not a book in the sense that you would recognise it. It's more a sort of concertina. And I have one here that I can demonstrate to you. The book organ developed by Anselm, the son of Gavioli, was not a book. In fact, it was, it was a, a series of cards joined like so, in a sort of concertina fashion. And the function was that to play music here, there are little, the cards pass over a series of little levers. And when a lever pops through a hole, a slot, it plays a, a note. It closes the note, opens the note, and so on. So you get various notes of different lengths uh, and different timings. Alongside you can have another series of slots which do the same thing with another note, so you get harmonisation of the two. So that was fine for music. The next development, having arranged the music to be played by a series of slots, was invented by an ex-employee of Gavioli, Gavioli called Marenghi, who made his own organs eventually, but his innovation was to provide another row of slots, as you see here, for lights. And the same levers would go through there, but instead of blowing pipes, they would operate electrical switches to illuminate lamps. Now, by doing this, you could coordinate a note and a lamp, a note and a lamp, and so on. So you got the equivalent of uh, discos, in effect. You got music, which was keeping time, uh, or light keeping time with the music. Um, the effect of this was that the roundabout could be made to flash very many lights, up to hundreds of lights in, in his case, to keep time with the music being played. The light and sound coordination developed by Marenghi was in 1906, a very early uh, effort at having a disco coordination. Um, by 1912, however, uh, Gavioli himself, who was now getting old, um, he gave up because uh, the Marenghi had moved off his key foremen and workers and the whole skill of building organs was lost to, Marenghi, to, to Gavioli. Uh, as a result, he decided to, to resign and he sold to some other people who actually made carpet sweepers and the proud name of Gavioli was printed on the carpet sweepers, which was the last straw for him because the carpet sweepers didn't work. That's the end of the Gavioli story. Can I now turn to uh, the organs themselves and their types? There are basically three types of organ. Uh, there's the street organ, which is normally mounted on wheels and is either pushed from place to place, or if it's bigger, uh, horse-drawn from place to place, and it plays in the streets. The other kind are dance organs. They're normally in halls and can occupy the whole of a, uh, the wall of a dance hall. Very large they are. And the property of them is to accentuate the bass beat, because dancing requires that you keep time, and the bass beat is the important thing, not the melody. Not so, however, in fairground organs, because in a fairground where there's lots of ambient noise around, you want to attract people's attention. And it so happens that the treble of music is carried through the air better than the bass. You'll recognise a tune better than the thump, thump, thump of a bass. And so they, they boost the treble in these organs so that people passing it through the fairground can hear and are attracted to this noise. And of course, anything that moves and is playing music and has coloured lights will attract their attention. It's a great draw for the people. What I'd like to do now is to outline to you the, the size and complexity of Gavioli organs. Uh, the uh, one I am about to demonstrate, which you'll hear later on, has 110 keys, 843 pipes, and weighs four tons. Uh, this, however, tends to be uh, an organ for use in fairgrounds out with a roundabout, but rather to attract people by the sound. So I'd like to demonstrate now on the slides some of the uh, organs we've been talking about. We'll now discuss the music of the roundabouts, generally generated by some kind of organ, either steam or pneumatic air or whatever. 
This picture shows a gavioli organ of the sort of four ton type I've been talking about and occupies the whole of a wall of some fairground somewhere. Notice the scale because here we have a doorway which you can walk through. That will be at least six feet tall uh, and therefore the organ itself must be 12 feet tall, richly decorated in statuary which is typical of gavioli and can be recognized by the cognoscenti as being gavioli. This is a, a Morty organ, there's nothing special about it except it's richly decorated and the functional bit is sort of there and there. That's all, all the rest is decoration. Shows the, the, the extent they went to for making the, the organ look attractive. Morty had nothing special, he came from Belgium. Um, this however is a merengue organ. Now merengue, you remember, was this, uh, an employee of Gavioli, left the company, took the workers with him and he introduced the lights. Now here you have some of the lights which are triggered by the slots in the book that I demonstrated earlier. And there's the standard organ downstairs with drums and cymbals and so on, as you'll see later. So that's typical of merengue. This is a gavioli organ for use within a roundabout. And here you see the pipes and the, the flutes and so on, the drums and the cymbals, uh, which create the music from the cards and the book organ, as we've described already. What we have here under cover is a model, 24th scale model, of a carousel of the type we've been describing, complete with model gavioli organ and galloper horses and lights and music. So we'll let you see that now. And if we rotate it, you see the effect of the galloping horses. Now as I bring the lights up, these become more clear and you'll not only see the horses, but also the cockerels, which I've described as well. The lights come up. And in addition, we'll bring up the music. This is the genuine sound of a gavioli organ, the only one of two remaining. One has been artificially, artificially uh, uh, recovered, but this is a genuine one playing as originally with the book organ. And there's only one left in the world. What I'd like to do now, in conclusion, is read you a little extract I discovered which summarizes to me the whole uh, story of roundabouts and the romantic association that people have with them. It says, It was always best after dark, when coloured lights made everything magical so that even the damp grass underfoot sparkled with crimson and gold and carved and painted wood turned into dragons and horses and peacocks with jewel tails and glittering eyes. It was grand when you were crushed by the crowds, shouting to be heard over the music belting out from the steam organs, and sometimes you laughed until you cried and everything became a rippling blur of light. And it was best of all, of course, if you were a child, or courting, or very old and remembering. Thank you.